Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Agata Morka. I am SCOS coordinator. And today we are going to talk a little bit more about SCOS itself, but also specifically, this event is for uh, our third pledging round in which we have three infrastructures. So we have, we have Archive, we have uh, Redelic America, and we also have DSpace. So today with us, uh, we have three represent, representatives from these three infrastructures, as well as two representatives of the SCOS board, and they will all discuss um, a little bit of the background behind the third pledging round, um, what it is that uh, each of the infrastructure offers for you, and what it is that they need your support for. Um, we will start with short presentations of each infrastructure, and then we will have time for the panel discussion, as well as for the Q&A se session at the very um, end of the session. So you're welcome to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, you, can, you can see it also on the bottom of your screen. Um, there is an icon for Q&A. So off we go, first of all, what is SCOS? SCOS, Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services. So um, SCOS is, an, uh, is a coalition, it's, it's, it is an organization that looks into ways of, um, of supporting open science infrastructure and of creating a sustainable ways of supporting open science infrastructures involving libraries and involving, uh, involving pledgers and funders. The way we operate, we operate um, as a sort of a crowdfunding solution. So um, what SCOS does is we look into the landscape of open science infrastructure. We try to choose the ones that we think are extremely important for the scholarly communication system. And then we promote them to the community, asking pledgers to pledge for the infrastructures. So this slide shows you a little bit of the background about SCOS. So why it is that we decided to, uh, to first of all, to establish SCOS. As you can see, we exist from 2017. Um, and um, it's, SCOS is, an, in a way, a response to certain challenges that we saw um, that uh, open science infrastructure um, is facing. So, um, so far, um, as, as I mentioned, um, we, uh, as SCOS, we do not take any money from, from pledgers. We are here simply to facilitate the process of pledging uh, to open science infrastructure. We are uh, community governed and um, we are very much invested in taking care of good governance. And um, what is also important for us among other factors is the transparency of our choices and also of transactions that are happening between the consortia or individual institutions and infrastructures. Um, you can see that um, there are many prestigious members of SCOS. Uh, so um, we have Cowell, we have Association of Research Libraries, we have CARL, we have Spark Europe, of course, because SCOS is part uh, is, is an, an, an initiative um, um, under the umbrella of Spark Europe. Um, so far, we have uh, managed to collect over 3.5 million euro for open science infrastructure um, from 291 institutions from 22 different countries. And so far, uh, we uh, supported eight infrastructures. And here are the infrastructures that we have supported so far. So we started with the pilot cycle with Sherpa Romeo and Directory of Open Access Journals. So as you can see, DOAJ, uh, they have reached their pledging target. Sherpa Romeo is still at 50% of their pledging target. Um, then we had the second round of pledging with three infrastructures. So first we had DOAB, Directory of Open Access Books and OAPEN, uh, which uh, this infrastructure has just 
reached uh, their um, pledging target last year, which we were very happy about. Then we have open citations and public knowledge project. Both of them are still on their way to receive, to receive enough support to actually fulfill their, um, their pledging targets. Um, and today, as I mentioned, we're going to talk specifically about our third round, which we launched um, in September last year. And we have Archive, we have Reda Likamelika, and we have DSpace. And SCOS is very proud to have all of these infrastructures on board. And um, we have uh, people representing all of them with us here today. And we will start with Archive. And Alison from, from Archive will tell you a little bit more about what it is that Archive does and what it is that they need your support for. So Alison, over to you, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're so pleased to be a part of the SCOS effort and supported by SCOS. So thank you so much for having us. And, um, and to all the participants here, thank you so much for um, spending time with us uh, to, to learn about these infrastructures. So Archive is an open platform to share and discover emerging science. So researchers around the world share um, their work on archive.org and they also read other people's work on archive.org. It's all free um, to read and post to archive. We have a 30 year history in digital open access. Um, archive was the first digital preprint server. Um, and so we have a long track record. Uh, your researchers at your institutions are probably already using Archive in some way or another. Um, there are 2 million scholarly articles in eight major subject areas. And those subject areas are <laughs> physics, math, computer science, quantitative biology, quantitative finance, statistics, electrical engineering, and economics. Um, so, uh, as I said, researchers can um, submit their articles. The articles are compiled into PDFs. Um, we have a search and discovery system. We distribute the articles on the web and also um, through email and through API distribution to other indexing services. Um, and we, um, we have a plan for preservation. So our guiding principles are openness, collaboration, scholarship, and interoperability. So next slide. Okay, so how does it work? <laughs> if you start over here on the left, you can see the author has completed a, a research project. They have research to submit. Um, they go on archive.org and um, register as a user. They upload their materials. And then it goes into our system. Um, and in our system, human moderators, <laughs> so actual people around the world, we have about 200 moderators around the world who check submissions for basic quality measures. Um, and there's also some automated systems that check for quality as well. I wanna point out that this is not peer review. Um, it's not as rigorous as peer review, it's, um, it's meant, to be fast so researchers can share their work um, as quickly as they want to when, when they feel ready to, to share their work. Um, then a, a full text PDF is produced online um, and, and then emails are sent to subscribers sharing the papers and the emails are sent um, almost every day of the week. Um, I think it's five days a week. And, um, and then of course, the people who receive the, that research and read that research get new ideas, are inspired to do new work, and the process continues, the cycle continues. Now, um, Archive offers different licenses for the work. Um, many of the licenses are uh, Creative Commons, um, so this encourages reuse and um, and you know indexing on other services and whatnot, so it's really uh, promoting openness. And out, so outside archive papers might be published also in conventional journals, also in overlay journals, which are basically journals that just use archive materials and then peer, add a layer of peer review on top of that. 
um, or any other use like grant applications, for example. Okay, next slide. So um, our governance structure is, is explained here. Uh, we are based at Cornell University in um, New York State. And um, so Cornell University stewards archive, it provides an organizational structure for us. Um, and then we have the archive executive director, scientific director and staff uh, that handles daily operations, policy questions, um, content workflow, that sort of thing. And then we have um, two advisory boards. One is the member advisory board. So for example, if your institution decides to become a member, you have the eligibility to be elected to the member advisory board to advise on issues like financial sustainability, institutional interests, policies, and open access. We also have a scientific advisory board um, that is made up of scientists who actively use archive. Um, and they provide advice on things like scientific oversight, the scope of subjects, like if a new, if a new community wants to, um, like a new academic uh, area wants to join archive, they just help decide if, if there's enough interest. Um, and also they help oversee the moderators who make the decisions about um, what content is posted to archive. Okay, next slide, whoops. Uh, so usage, we've had 2.2 billion downloads since 1991 when we were founded. We have about 30 million, 35 million downloads per month now. As I said, we have 2 million articles um, and our, the submissions to archive, as you can see in this graph, are just you know rising exponentially. Um, we have submissions originating from 140 countries around the world, so usage it's clear that researchers want to share their research quickly and openly. So that's really exciting for us. Next slide. Here uh, you can see, um, this is just a snapshot of submissions by country. Um, and I focused on Latin America today. Um, and if you don't see your country here, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not using it. These were just the ones I could pull out. Um, quickly from our list. So um, these are submissions of articles um, per year. This is an average over the past three years. Um, so you can see we have uh, some a lot of usage from Brazil, Mexico, um, Chile, Argentina, Colombia, and then um, still a pretty significant usage from others, from the, the, the other countries on this list. Um, I want to point out that this is submissions. So these are researchers who are posting their work to archive. I'm sure that many of your um, uh, researchers are, are downloading the articles as well. I don't have that information today, but if you're curious, I can try to find that information. You can um, ask me later and uh, I can follow up by email. All right, next slide. Oh, is there a was there a skip? There we go. Yeah. Did I? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I got mixed up, I think. Yeah. OK, sustainability issues. Um, so archive submissions have increased ex exponentially, but we only have four full-time employees, less than actually less than four full-time employees who are devoted to actually helping those articles get through the system. Um, and that number has not changed um, in about 10 years. Uh, also, um, <laughs> one of our strengths, of course, is that we have been around for 30 years, so, so the operation is well established. However, um, parts of the service still rely on decades old code that is not scalable for the um, number of submissions that we're experiencing now. So your, if you choose to, to um, help fund archive, your funding will support open source code, modernized user interfaces, um, streamlined workflows, moving to the cloud. Um, and all of these, all of these efforts um, really support um, the maintenance, the evolution, flexibility, and interoperability of of archive. And I want to focus too on interoperability. It's so important um, 
for archive to have connections across the scholarly communications landscape. So for example, when one of your researchers searches Google Scholar, they will also find archive articles um, or um, maybe PubMed, um, Europe, Europe PubMed Central, um, some of the biology articles will show up there. So this interoperability really enhances the reach of, um, of the research. Okay, next. So <clears throat> this is our pledging target um, and we have different donation levels. We usually ask um, institutions to uh, consider their usage of, um, of archives. So uh, like down here, this middle one, 5,000 US dollars, if, if your institution is among the top 100 institutions submitting articles to archive, we suggest a $5,000 contribution. Um, and, then, uh, and then it goes down from there. We also um, encourage any institutions that have the means and, the, and really support our um, open science to consider donating more. Of course, we understand that COVID especially has really put a strain on many institutions. And, um, and so we are flexible um, uh, if, any, if anyone wants to join at a lower level, like if you're in the top 100, but you don't have the budget, uh, you're welcome to join at the lower level, the lower community level. Um, and we do offer the 10% discount uh, for uh, consortia of 10 or more organizations. So my, um, my email is down here at the bottom, membership at archive.org. And I really look forward to hearing from some of you. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, so that was archive. And now next um, to Ariana, who will present uh, Redelic America. Muchas gracias, Agatha. Y gracias a todos los que están thank conectados. you, Agatha, and thank you for being connected to the call today. For us, it's a pleasure to be here today in this webinar. And unquestionably, we're all in-house. Most of us connected one way or another already know us. But I'd like to emphasize and talk about this campaign, which is something new for a region, which is something our community and the culture in our region Latin America is not so much accustomed to to fund in this way and that's why I'd like to deal with the benefit of readily and for having been elected as one of the initiatives positively assessed by SCOS. First of all I'd like to talk about this and it's the importance of the work SCAS is doing regarding guaranteeing funding and sustainability of the non-commercial initiatives is essential. And it's essential not only for Latin America, but for the entire world, because we've seen a context of consolidation of the commercial market of scientific communication in many areas from scientific publication, but also not only access, but also the production of scientific journals, assessment of research. So many points in the generation of knowledge and scientific communication are being uh, marketed. And therefore there's a strong inclusion, not only of the developing countries that don't have the means, to have access to these communication circuits, but also lead to a low representation, little diversity, little inclusion of several people around the world. For this reason, the work SCOS is carrying out is very important because it's inviting us not only to think in a coordinated, organized fashion in terms of why and how to support initiatives such as the ones being presented today and that have been supported in previous periods, but also it's having an effect on generating this awareness and in turn help these investments be distributed more equitably. And this is very important. And in particular, the benefit 
uh, it's brought about to readily economica regardless what can be collected in terms of economic resources but also in the creation of these infrastructures in the transparency and making evident our governance models the value each one of the initiatives have in the ecosystem of open access this is also something uh, that is uh, due to scores and that's why we're very thankful Redalic like and Amelic, as you know, we participate as two sister infrastructures. On one hand, Redalic, uh, it's an index of scientific journals. We have over 1,400. We're actually getting to 1,500 journals, the double A diamond, and it's focused on open access diamond. We only index no APC magazines or journals since 2018, since open access journals that charge authors started to come up. So we decided just to focus our service on open access diamond journals. They're published by 670 institutions, basically universities, research centers, academic organizations from 31 countries. And although it, uh, it exist in Latin America as part of the culture of open access uh, that happens in Latin America where journals are published by universities, uh, governments, institutions, and public uh, agencies also help fund scientific publication. And it comes out as an existence, uh, this um, context as value added initiatives towards the scientific publications that are uh, created in the academic sector. Uh, it's been expanded to other regions in the world. We have journals from Africa, India, uh, Europe, uh, many since we opened to other regions. We have a very high demand of assessment of European journals that also seek for non-commercial publication and not to charge authors and of course readers. Uh, we have over 700,000 full text articles and a repository of full text articles of over 1.8 million authors in 150 countries. This initiative that has existed for 20 years has consolidated services through the network of journals because in turn it integrates production services and editorial flows for scientific journals so the services are not only in terms of uh, querying uh, documents but editorial production in 2018 amelica comes up an initiative that is accompanied by other organizations universities supported by unesco led by redelic and claxo and with over 20 partner universities seeks to strengthen and carry out actions to avoid the degradation of the non-commercial system that was happening in Latin America. To date, it's happening. There are countries that have raised flags in terms of how they're transforming open access non-commercial culture to commercial open access and the distribution of resources is not so much focused on uh, journals uh, published by universities and this is where there's a series of flags and there's an organization to guarantee that academic communica uh, communication continues non-commercial equitable that we look for biodiversity and multilingualism and all these initiatives are supported by SCOS. Next, please. And they were selected, as you know, Redelic and Emelika, what they do is take a scientific publication and provide it with value added services from editorial production uh, tools, XML, uh, quality certificates, and different services 
for the editors from visibility indicators, interoperability, and discovery metrics and statistics that allow us to provide a follow up to who query and how it is that this knowledge is intertwined by uh, scientific journals. And in this regard, we have a service infrastructure where we can, next please, of the work of the of quality certification. Um, and the important thing is there's a rigorous assessment to guarantee that index journals not only meet um, the requirements, but they're also reviewed by peers that have solid re uh, peer review processes that they have, they comply with qual editorial quality uh, criteria promoted by Redelic. First, we do an internal assessment and then it goes to an international council made up by people from different areas in different countries that give a qualitative assessment in regards to the indexation of the magazine Redelic. Once it enters Redelic, it, uh, they have access to all digital production tools so that they can uh, free of charge uh, uh, for readers and editors uh, that they are opened all of these services to generate XML and in turn assisted by AI algorithm to generate different elements of the electronic publication, PDF, HTML, a pick of, and different readers are generated automatically for the journal, both in Redelic, but also they have the chance to download these formats and take them to their own websites. In turn, there's a microsite generated within Redelic with the articles published by the magazine and different consultation services that help improve visibility. In turn, it's exported to different libraries and different institutional repositories. So at any rate, there's a digital distribution of the content to optimize and maximize uh, the, uh, discovery capacity as well as the impact on science. So this is how knowledge is distributed in the planet. And finally, it's part of a group of metrics that we're also making available through Redelic to measure scientific production of institutions and countries from different disciplines. And you can find this information of open access in Redelic. And it's also part of the open data services. So all of these layers of value added that a journal receives as additional services apart from what they have in their own websites and it helps disseminate knowledge much faster and effectively but also to provide a guarantee of the quality of the magazine this is why several countries uh, journals receive a score and certain support because it's also indexed in redelict next please We've also been fine tuning our governance model. This is important to say it because somehow, those of you that know Redelic and Amalika, uh, Redelic comes out as an academic project from a public uh, state owned university in Mexico as part of the activities of a group of researchers anchored in a university. It's been evolving and growing to guarantee the governance from both initiatives and Malika from the very beginning came out as a civil organization. It has a different nature than Redelic and somehow they've been evolving and consolidating the governance system in Redelic. We have a board of directors uh, within this research group registered in the Ministry of Education in Mexico as a consolidated academic uh, group supported by an advisory board at international level within the protocols and the way of operating of a project within the university with the councils within the university and all of these academic and research procedures uh, 
defined at the university. And we're also creating a contributors committee right now because this way of funding is new to us. We're also giving space in governance to every entity that participates in the funding of both initiatives. And this committee is being created as well as the bylaws regarding the, the committee and the role in, their role in governance. Next, please. We're registering around 12.6 million downloaded articles in average by month. And this is one of the reasons why we applied to get funding through SCOS uh, from the community, because we have an infrastructure that is increasingly more limited for the demand, not only of users around the world, but also the journals that are uh, making publications digitally in our tools. We have around 28.5 20, um, users a year, and there are even days where we have 120,000 users per day uh, with a network speed that is not optimal and a server infrastructure that is not optimal for, for this demand. Next, please. Here you can see the downloads per country. Evidently, we have a very strong download by Latin American countries. Unquestionably, there are biggest users, but we also have a strong presence of visits from other countries. And this has been building up from the fact that we're affecting journals from other countries. So there's a direct relationship when you index uh, journals from other countries, you start uh, seeing users showing up from other countries. And this is what we're seeing with African countries right now, where we normally didn't see any activity in Redelic. And now we have African countries in the top list. Uh, from the point we started to index journals from Africa, the same is true for India. So I think we will be looking at this map and how it's created through time because we're working with editors from uh, publishers in other places in the world more formally. Uh, next. Next. Um, we can share the presentation if you want to look at it. Next, please. I would like to take uh, the last few minutes that I have to talk about our sustainability problems. As we mentioned before, Redelic comes out as an Ameri uh, academic project, and it's been funded by uh, the Autonomous University of Mexico and also through different collaboration projects, all of them academic, and it's received resources from the Ministry of Education in Mexico and different public instances of different governments, basically the Mexican government, um, but also from different collaboration agreements we've carried out with universities where we've had uh, donations in kind, collaborative work in other countries, as the case of Venezuela, where we were working with the University of the Andes in Venezuela for over 10 years with a remote cell of people working for Redelic uh, with Los Andes, uh, Venezuela. So the sustainability of Redelic has been built up in a cooperative fashion based on academic resources coming from universities in the public sector from various countries. However, this work has grown in such a way that it's increasingly difficult to sustain the work of Redelic and assume commitments to carry out collaboration agreements to get grants uh, for projects because there's a central task in Redelic and it's to distract from the central task in Redelic to attend other projects. And this model of sustainability through 
academic projects is increasingly more difficult to carry out, given the demand of services and the generation of technology we'll be doing in Red Lake for scientific journals and users at large. And that's why we're trying to get funding through uh, donation mechanisms and we're participating precisely with this project where Red Alex seeks to obtain this amount of money that we'll see later uh, over a million euros to remodel the server infrastructure that is obsolete. And it's for this, it'll be re uh, re uh, reported um, transparently. It's not for the operational expenses, but to renew the infrastructure, uh, the servers and uh, buy infrastructure that allows us to improve the performance of our services, uh, the bandwidth, uh, the communication devices that we don't have. And that's why we can't continue sustaining the service with the best level of response. The truth is there's an important risk. We have servers that have existed for 12 years with us, and it's not, no longer possible to bring them up to date, and it's even uh, costly. So that's why we're trying to seek to strengthen this infrastructure through this project to be able to have a better user response and guarantee that in the next few years, we have the infrastructure to operate our services. Next, please. Uh, our objective is to collect one point, uh, almost 1.2 euros, a uh, million euros, and we have different levels of uh, contributions. We we're proposing this uh, proposal evidently with every pledger, anyone who wants to participate. We're also looking at specific cases of organizations and institutions that have less or more that want to contribute more or less resources. But for large organizations from developed countries, we're proposing 4,000 euros a year for small organizations, 2,000, for funders, 8,000, for national, regional governments, international organizations, 5,000 euros, and for small organizations or personal donations from 500 euros. In the end, this can facilitate management, but I insist we're having contributions right now and we're looking at them case uh, case basis because they pledge uh, for three years, some others for two. So we're looking at each one of the cases. And like I said, although in Latin America, we're somehow accustomed for resources to be distributed from an academic uh, perspective, and we don't have this culture so much, it's important for us to think where our libraries are investing and the transformational um, agreements and strong databases that didn't happen uh, three years ago, or oh, and to strengthen non-commercial services that are also part of this ecosystem of open science. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariana. And now over to this space, and I believe that um, Michela will be presenting. So Michela Minelli and this space for you now. Michela, over to you. Thank you, Agatha. Uh, buenos dias a todos. Uh, gracias por estar aquí. Uh, gracias a SCOS. Thank you all. Thank you, SCOS, for organizing this important event. Um, I was uh, thinking about, um, because we have translation and her Spanish is slightly better than mine, uh, I will switch to English, uh, although the slides are in Spanish. As I said, and uh, I'm, I'm going to present a few slides, a few concepts about, about this space. You might have heard about this space as a platform uh, since this space is uh, the, the widest adopted uh, repository platform uh, around the world. Based on Open Door, uh, it's uh, uh, more than 40% of all the repositories around the world are actually running in this space at the moment. It's an open source platform 
uh, that helps you uh, store and, and manage and organize um, uh, lots of uh, data and publications around uh, your research activities. Uh, uh, currently, uh, thanks to the latest version of it, uh, it's a little bit even more than that, but we're gonna talk about it later. Uh, and as an open source platform uh, is is actually free to download, as as you as you know, and that would be uh, again one of the topic of this of this brief presentation, particularly the last one, one of the major issue we are, we are facing it. But uh, that's also what what helps the broad adoption uh, of it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I, I decided to start this presentation uh, talking about a concept that is a little bit broader than the repository itself, uh, because I do believe uh, that the platforms we are talking about uh, today and, and uh, others in our ecosystem are more important when they are thought in a broader ecosystem. And so uh, since we're all talking about open science and and, uh, and open softwares, I, I, I think it's also a good a, a, a moment to uh, discuss or at least reflect on the idea of uh, an open infrastructure um, uh, because we can create something that is broader than a platform used by an institution, broader than a platform uh, used in a, in a region or uh, because we're talking about the global activities I and mean, anything related to research is global itself. So when, when I think of an infrastructure, particularly related to uh, any kind of research activities, uh, you have to consider lots of different parts of technologies. I mean, you have to consider, um, I see a, a comment, uh, so I can hear English now. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I thought it was uh, related to my presentation. So you have to consider lots of different te uh, technologies and pieces of technology. So you have to consider the protocols that you're using. Uh, you have to consider the regulations and the policies within the different uh, regions uh, when, when you use uh, or develop uh, an infrastructure. Uh, you have to consider the broad uh, uh, ecosystem related to any kind of academic uh, 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 activities. You have to consider the software themselves that you want to use, uh, the services on top of the, so uh, of the softwares and platforms. You need to find the ways for all of them to, to communicate and interoperate uh, within each other. Uh, and then when you think of it as an open platform, you have to consider lots of different aspects of openness. Obviously, I mean, open can be the, the code, the source code of the technology you're building, but that's not enough. Uh, you have to consider a way to, to openly distribute and access the information you're you are storing or uh, uh, managing in that with that platform. Uh, you have to consider everything that is related uh, uh, to the management of open data. Um, uh, you have to consider how uh, the community can access and support uh, and, uh, and, and develop that kind of open infrastructure if the community has a say in the governance and the evolution of those platforms themselves. You have to consider that today, as I mentioned before, since we're talking about a global activities, also the, the policy regulations and rules needs to be uh, uh, global and compliant with, with global needs. Um, uh, you have to consider that uh, when you develop any kind of open infrastructure of open software or open platform, uh, it brings together the idea that also our minds should be open because we, we, we have to collaborate, we have to interoperate, not uh, just at the technology, technological level, but also as a, as a personal and human level. Uh, next slide, please. I think the, the importance of all of it, so obviously I mean, my, my focus today, it, it, it is on this space and repositories, and so I, I try to position the role of the repository into uh, an infrastructure, uh, particularly if it's open. And why we do believe that, particularly based on the examples that we see in our communities that are using this space in very different forms, why repositories can actually play a very important role in building up this open global infrastructure. Uh, because within a repository, uh, I mean, any piece of, of data that, that, that and information that is in the repository brings together lots of different other sources, other data, other information, so other activities, and, and other, other realities, I would say. Uh, because if you 
take a publication, their, 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 their ideas and data around those, the, those publications. There's the efforts, their, their activities, their, their resources used, their, their collaborations among uh, different researchers around the world. And then there's the idea of, uh, of sharing all of those. And if a repository is built up thinking of an open global infrastructure, you can think about how to integrate all the different activities related to the research ecosystem and information systems at a global level that should interoperate, interoperate among each other and between each other in order to be able for any kind of institutions at the, at, the, at the local, national, or regional, or international level to understand the data that are in the, in the different repositories around the world and to use them to make informed decisions that are useful for all of us. And I, I don't want to get into the details or examples that in the past two years we, we went through, but the possibility to have uh, 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 openly accessible publications around the pandemic we are in, thanks to the repositories and to access to the preprints that are there in the repositories, make a big difference in the development of science and research around those. So that's 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 the idea of why it is important in open infrastructure and the role of repositories. Next slide, please. And this, and, and, and this is the, the reason why if we have technologies and repositories in our case that are, that are very much um, uh, interconnected around the world, um, uh, we can create this, this open network of ecosystems uh, that can support the activities we do. Now, obviously in order to do that, uh, we have to, as I said before, the open-mindedness that I was referring, we have to reconsider the way we look at technologies and we have to reconsider the role that those technologies do have within our institution. So uh, when we think about a repository as, as a, a, a place to store some data, that's not as necessarily it. Uh, it is actually a tool, that it's, it's a strategic tool for institutions to fulfill their missions and, and it's not just a place to store data, it's, it's an agora of data. It's where data meets and becomes information, so useful information. Um, as I mentioned before, and, and this is what this space is currently doing, thanks to the contributions coming from, from many different countries, uh, to think of a repository that can comply with needs, not only regulations or policies, but needs that come uh, uh, out of different uh, regions and, and so and speak different languages uh, because the policies are also a matter of, of understanding each other's. Um, we can consider this piece of technology as a, a unique or, or a standalone piece of technologies. We have to consider it within a much broader uh, ecosystem. We need to comply with all the data and, and the policies that are around. But most importantly for me is that we do have to consider that any kind of free software or open source software, they're not free because they're there for everyone to use. They're free because they are collective responsibilities. So we do have a collective responsibility to maintain and support all of these technologies. And so again, thanks to COS to provide that kind of support to many of those of those projects. Next slide, please. So uh, 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 now, how the space and the this space community fits in all of this, and how we, are we structure and, and try to do what we do? Um, so this space, as I mentioned, is, is an open source uh, uh, community led program. And when I say community led, is because uh, the the membership structure has been in place for many years for this space. And the whole idea is that the users, but more specifically the members of, of this space, are the ones who actually lead the future development of the platform itself. So they steer uh, the, the governance of the project. Um, uh, uh, this space currently has a leadership group, which is um, uh, 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 which is the, the, the most global uh, uh, governance uh, of the, of the Lyris's um, uh, op um, open source platforms and programs. Lyris is the organizational home of many different open source projects, including this space. Besides that, there's Vivo and Fedora, 
collection space, and archive space, and others. Uh, uh, but the governance of this space is very much global. There are 22 uh, leaders representing 11 different countries. Uh, so there's the leadership groups. The leadership groups uh, uh, group elects the, the steering group, which is formed by nine different um, uh, people. And they are the ones who meet more often. Those two groups are the ones who meet regularly every month. Actually, the leadership group meets uh, uh, four times a year, where the, the steering group meets every month. And they are basically the board of directors of, of the program. They're the ones who make the decisions. They're the one who understands, the, uh, who define the priorities, the roadmap of the projects that come out of the, of the um, in collaboration with the committer groups. The committer group is the, is the technical group of, of this space. And, uh, and then there are a variety of working groups uh, and user groups, uh, uh, but of those we're going to talk about later. Uh, again, next slides, please. So some numbers of this space, I mentioned that it is, uh, it is uh, the, the, the most wide adopted um, uh, open source repository platform around the world. Uh, the, based on the repository uh, uh, that we have, so the registry of, of these space installations, which is based on voluntary basis. So if you download this space, you may or may not uh, add uh, a, your instance to, uh, Agatha, can you? Go back for a second. Thank you. Uh, you may or may not uh, add your instance to the registry, but for what we know, there are over 30,000 installations of this space around the world. And when I say around the world, I actually mean it because we're talking about more than 120 countries around the world, and there are 20 different uh, languages uh, uh, spoken in the platform, well, so within the platform. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you the distribution of those users and instances around the world in the next slide. Um, so, as I mentioned, the, the, an important component of the community, of this open community, uh, maybe the most important one, is the community itself. Uh, because uh, when, when, you, when you get to a point where you, you, you develop something for and by the community, uh, the engagement with that community is very important. Uh, thanks to the, the, the organizational home role of Lyricis, we managed to support uh, the creation of different national user group of this space. Uh, that means that there are, uh, so we, we, we tend to define this space as a community of communities. Um, this is because uh, uh, users of this space exist no matter what, because the platform is used. What, what we're trying to create is the link between the users in order to create this kind of collective intelligence that will actually help the program to, uh, to develop um, uh, according to the, to the needs of the same community. So we started working with um, um, representatives of different countries to try to understand how we can actually uh, better get in contact with, with, with the different communities. And we created um, more than 21 uh, national user groups. Most of them are actually in Latin America. I would say that the half of it. Uh, and they're also the most active ones because the, the number of users of this space in Latin America, it's, it's very big. And I, I'll show you some percentage later. But thanks to the national user groups, we managed to organize tons of online events, unfortunately only online in the past two years, but before the pandemic, we were actually meeting in person. So we organized over 30, 30 webinars, uh, reaching out to over 3000 people in 16 different countries and, and providing content and webinar in five different uh, languages. The other important things of this space, and again, I, I was mentioning the importance of being in an ecosystem that is broader than the piece of technology we, we represent, it is the partnership that we've been creating around the world because we all share very similar missions. And as you can see uh, on the bottom of this slide, it's interesting to see the difference also uh, in the nature of the partnership that we created. Uh, one that you, and I assume, know, uh, might know very well is La Referencia, and uh, we're partnering with them in order to to, to better support the, the DSpace community in Latin America. 
core as the coalition of open access repositories around the world and open air in Eurocris, they all represent an aspect of these uh, 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 ecosystem uh, repositories are in. Next slide, please. Those are the numbers. So the, the, I mean, the previous ones were the general numbers of the space. Those are the numbers of the space in Latin America, focus on that. So um, if you look at the pie, uh, you, you can see that 22%, uh, uh, I think, yeah, over 20% of all the users of this space, all the 3000 plus installations around the world, are in Latin America. So that means that it's like a, a, a fourth of the whole community with 650 installations there uh, and equally distributed among the different countries. Now, this is what, again, this is, this is not official. This is what we know. And I can, I can give you an example of uh, how those numbers might not be necessarily right um, uh, uh, based on the experience we had in Peru, uh, where we thought there were like three uh, instances of, of this space. And then we started partnering with, with a national organization there, Concitec, who's been part of Lyris um, and, and this space for quite a while. And they helped us understand the real number of users of this space in that country. And we got up to 200 institutions. So this number by, by, might be even higher. And that explained the importance of Latin America to be more involved in the space itself, in the, in the program governance. Because as you can see, only one member uh, comes from Latin America uh, and in the whole community, in, in, out of all the users of this space in Latin America and all the members of, of the governance that I said at 22. So not being in the governance means that you, I mean, your, your voice is a little bit less heard and you don't have enough chances to actually bring your contribution also at the, at the decision-making level, which is very important for a community-based uh, project. Uh, next slide, please. And, 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 and with this one, we come to, to the end of the reason why we're all here. Um, so there are, I, mean, I shouldn't say that, but, 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 but it's true, and we all know that there are many issues that uh, any uh, uh, community-led uh, or open source platform uh, needs to face, there are many, uh, and, and uh, particularly in the world we, we live in, I mean, there are priorities, there, the, the, the systems come from a commercial sector, there, there are many things, but, but, but we pick the one that we feel that more important for us, and and we're sure that with, with the contribution of everyone, we can actually fix them. And it's not that, that hard to do that. Uh, so one of our main issues is that uh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big difference between the number of users and the number of members. Uh, we're talking about thousands of users. We're talking about 90, 95 members today. So it's, I mean, the, the difference is it's, it's, it's big because on the one hand, um, Maybe the program wasn't able enough to, to communicate to all the users, but on the other hand, there's this kind of mindset where if a, a piece of software is free, I can use it for, my, for, for myself and, and then it's there, it's available. The problem is there is available as long as the community believes in it and support it. If, if, if we miss that part, the software is not gonna be available anymore and you might need to rely on a commercial platform, which has a very different approach than, than an open, uh, open source one as, as we do have. Um, the other problem of, of relying on community effort is the, the timing of the development of the software itself. Uh, I've been in many uh, uh, meetings in, uh, around the world and, 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 and most of the time also I was asked, so when is the new release happening? When are you going to deliver something? When, and this, this conversation happened with Display 7, the last release, which is a most <laughs> release, is, is, the, is, the, is the biggest release of the history of this space. And, and to this question, I always answer that uh, it's gonna happen when, when you're going to contribute as well in, in order for it to happen faster. It's it's when something is community based. It's not there's there's not a company behind who has its roadmap and do things because they're paid to do that. 
it's an effort, it's a shared effort that we all have to contribute in order. If, if you have a goal, you should be part of it in order, in order to reach it. And that's, that's what we're trying to, to do here as well. Uh, and, but in order to deliver faster, uh, the governance of the space last year decided to uh, uh, push the development, so, uh, uh, paying for developers uh, time uh, in order to move the DSpace release, uh, the DSpace 7 release a little bit faster. And the last issue we are trying to face is, is the fact that the platform is, is for global use. It's not easy uh, to do that. And, and as I mentioned before, we need to be able to communicate and support the global community, which is not uh, uh, the same thing of, of supporting a national community, for example, because the language barriers, there are time zones. So we need uh, uh, the kind of uh, 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 support and, and, and skills that uh, uh, do have the opportunity to, to support a community that is much broader than than the one we currently do. So with the support of SCOS, the goal is to, to get at least um, a program manager and, uh, and a junior developer. Those two uh, profiles will be able to get more involved with the community, more in touch with the community, and to bring the development uh, forward faster than, than it is today. Uh, uh, next slides, which is also gonna be the last one. And uh, so the goal in two years is to get to uh, 663,000 uh, dollars euros, uh, uh, which is uh, enough to cover uh, the expenses for those two figures I and mean, profiles that I mentioned before. A different way. So uh, as I mentioned, this space has always been a membership based uh, model and, and we do have different years. Uh, they go from copper to platinum. We have a variety of different options, but what is important that we added for, uh, for this cost uh, uh, initiative is to apply a 25% discount for any kind of group or uh, uh, consortia uh, membership uh, of uh, 10 organizations or uh, more. Uh, if you have questions about this base or how the governance work or uh, whether everything is public, so. Uh, anything you find on the wiki, any kind of meetings we do have, they're all public uh, in, the, in the wiki. We are also trying to translate uh, all that materials uh, thanks to the support of the uh, Spanish-speaking national user groups that we have. So you might soon find some important documentation in your language as well. That's the hope. That's, that's what, what, we're, what we're working on. But that's also what we need your support for. Um, so if you have any questions, you can come contact Christy, you can contact uh, Laurie or myself at, at thespacecast.pierces.org. And with that, um, again, thank you very much for being here and uh, I'm not sure who's gonna speak next. Thank you, Michaela. We are all going to speak next, I suppose. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that I have all the panelists back here with us on the screen. Um, we are running a little bit over time, so uh, as an executive decision, I'm going to combine the panel, uh, the panel discussion with the Q&A section. So there are certain questions that I would like to ask you, but I can see already in our Q&A chat that there is actually, there are also some questions coming from the audience. So Ariana, for the questions that are in Spanish, I will need your help if you could read them out in Spanish. That would be absolutely fantastic. But before we go to the q and I wanted to start with some questions to our SCOS board members, um, representatives. So uh, we have here with us today, Susan Hay, who is executive director of the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. And Susan, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the background of SCOS, about the backstage, so, so to speak. So could you tell us a little bit more about the SCOS vetting pro process? How do you decide which infrastructure to include in the SCOS pledging campaigns? Uh, yes, hi everybody. It would be my pleasure to, to discuss that. It is. Uh, I'm a board member, and it is. Uh, it is a privilege to be on this board because it's. Uh, it's a very innovative uh, undertaking, uh, SCOS, and I, I hope people have been uh, um, learning about how it works. 
Um, so the board um, is is comprised of, of uh, those who came forward to join SCOS in the first place, really organizations uh, nationally based usually or, or regionally in the case of Europe perhaps. And, and then the and then the, there's an advisory committee that is uh, um, that is named by the members of the board from their countries, people that are knowledgeable in terms of uh, practitioners or have expertise, are very familiar with open open access, the needs of the community, uh, um, wide ranging as they are, and so that group convenes. Um, a couple of times, so it's an interesting process. They we do an open call, um, and uh, receive expressions of interest. The group, the advisory group, meets uh, and uh, reviews those and develops a short list um, that that is then that and that short list is then invited. Those those uh, those infrastructures are invited to submit a much more. Um, a robust application. So, so we're not wasting anyone's time to, to in the first place. They, they, they then. Um, uh, uh, we have a application form. It, it's very. It gets honed to make sure that we're getting the right information that we need to do the evaluation. Um, the advisory committee meets again, maybe more than once. They score the uh, shortlisted. Um, uh, um, <clears throat> infrastructures and then the board ultimately takes the decision and the, de the board decides how many to to uh, uh, to endorse for any given round and and uh, um, and, and trying to make a, a judicious selection based on the scoring um, and and the ultimate sort of judicious mix that we're trying to achieve. Uh, so just to admit a quick word about what the criteria we've used are, um, there's value of the service. So the, uh, um, the, 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 the way that the funding applicate, the money needed is going to be used, uh, the fit of the, of the infrastructure in the open science landscape, uh, the value to the open access community, the international reach, if you will, and need. Um, uh, so the benefits of the service and then there's also a technical assessment that takes place in terms of the technical uh, relevance and, and sort of on, ongoing viability, I suppose. Uh, there's user data uh, requested in terms of demonstrating the impact and reach that has been achieved. Um, Look at the, they look at the costs, they look at the costs that are outlined in terms of whether they're realistic and whether the pledging target is a is a is a sensible pledging target. Um, there's some back and forth thing that happens as well from SCOS, I think, to, to help um, the infrastructures. They look at sustainability measures, as you've heard. Um, everybody's conscious of that because the objective really is that this is transitional. It's not it's not forever that SCOS is saying that they're, they're going to endorse like this and encourage. It's meant to be um, transitional. And they look for the at the work plan for the coming couple of years and see that it is, you know, taking the taking the infrastructure somewhere and they look at the governance. So we so all to say it's a rigorous process. Um, it's an invited process eventually, but it is based on somebody coming forward in the first place with a need. Thank you, Susan. It is quite a process indeed. Um, and I have a more specific question now uh, to another board member who is with, her, with uh, us here today. So Jean-Francois Lutz, uh, who's the head of research support services at Université de Lorraine. So Jean-Francois, I wanted to ask you specifically about the third pledging cycle. So what was the rationale behind choosing Archive, Red Lake America and DSpace for this specific round? Uh, thank you, Agatha, and uh, I'm also very pleased to be here with you. Um, and uh, yes, I, I was uh, thinking of uh, three reasons for each of the of the infrastructures. So, uh, regarding archive, I think that uh, it was already mentioned the fact that uh, archive is a vital infrastructure, a central infrastructure for many scientific disciplines: uh, mathematics, physics, computer science, and many others is, is was a very strong uh, fact a very strong uh, yeah decisive fact and uh, secondly we also uh, were very interested by the fact that uh, archive has, has shown a transformative uh, power 
in, in terms of research dissemination, uh, in terms of speed of dissemination, uh, the wide dissemination, and the archive has inspired uh, many other preprint services. Um, in France, for instance, uh, HAL uh, Open Archive was directly inspired by archive. And uh, we have seen more recently uh, preprint services <clears throat> in biology and medicine inspired by archive. So it's a very strong yeah, record for, for in favor of archive. And uh, last, uh, the sustainability need was uh, very critical uh, for archive to continue to thrive. And uh, I think that this cost funding will help to sustain innovation uh, for archives. So these were the, the three main reasons. And regarding this space, uh, we were also very, uh, it, we were struck by the importance uh, that uh, this space has acquired uh, over the years, uh, more than 3,000 organizations. We have just heard Michele talk about it, uh, yes, in the presentation. So a large number of user communities around the world. So key open, uh, key open, open source uh, repository software uh, at this space. And then we also have seen that this space has a long track record of uh, innovation and improvement of the software uh, with integration of new features. Uh, so the, the sustaining needs uh, are, are important and the cost funding will help uh, current and future releases to, to be up to date uh, on a technical level, I think. And the last thing is that uh, this space is an, is an open source software. So it gives you its users uh, universities, research communities, uh, the possibility not to be uh, dependent on uh, commercial entities. And uh, so they can remain in a way free and uh, independent. And I think this is also a very important criteria. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, Redalic and Amelica are concerned, uh, the, the fact that uh, it's Redalic is one of the four major uh, diamond journals platform worldwide is really uh, uh, an important uh, aspect, uh, and Redalic and Amelica have a, they are based uh, in Latin America, but they have a global uh, relevance. Uh, uh, the publishing service is widely known and acknowledged, and uh, I think that the extension of Redalic, uh, of the Redalic model through Amelica and through partnerships with India and Africa is really a great interest uh, for, for the SCOS board and uh, has to be encouraged and uh, sustained by the funding. And last, uh, the fact that Redalic and Amelica have a strong emphasis on diamond publishing, on uh, bibliodiversity, on multilingualism is also a key um, because SCOS is, has also the willingness to support a more equitable, a more diverse, a more inclusive open access ecosystem. And uh, for that, I think Redalic and Amelica is a very uh, important uh, infrastructure. And uh, we, we were quite comforted, uh, even if the decisions what has been taken before the study on diamond journals and before the UNESCO recommendation on open science, I think Redalic and Amelica fit very well uh, within these, uh, these two strong uh, documents and declaration. Um, and just to, to conclude, and if we, if we take a, a step back uh, and consider the, the three infrastructures, we have two infrastructures that are mostly targeting repositories, one infrastructure that is more targeting open access journals. So we have the two main uh, aspects of open access and uh, the two legs of open access. So we can walk and uh, move forward uh, with balance. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Jean-Francois. I very much like your metaphor about having two legs and being able to walk. Um, there is a question specifically to the SCOS board members coming from our audience, coming from Alma, and I'm warning, it's a, it's a difficult question. I'm going to read it out loud. So for the SCOS board members, what would you say to Latin American governments that are stopping the provision of resources to non-commercial journals because they believe researchers should publish in impact factor journals, mainly from commercial corporations. I don't know if Jean-Francois or Susan, who, Susan, you would like to take this? Go ahead, please. Well, I, I can start. I, I, I mean, I, I would tend to say um, that it's it's short-sighted in, in, in a way at this point because there are viable alternatives. We've heard from some of them and we understand that. And, and basically it's an expensive 
in the long term, it's an expensive choice. This is this is so the objective I think we we have is to build a uh, um, community controlled viable ecosystem um, as as well and and. and not necessarily uh, with a view that we will never have other commercial journals or, or, or so on, but the, basically um, these alternatives are more equitable, they access, um, they are more, um, more, um, more able to be uh, uh, allowing the flow of, of research worldwide uh, to all parts and, and the, the, the generation of new research out of all parts of the world. So I think it's just a, it's, it's a bit sort of, uh, it, it's, it's not wise in the long run. Yes, and I totally agree with Susan. And maybe I would add that uh, Latin America has shown such a very strong leadership in terms of uh, diamond open uh, journals, and it would be such a pity uh, that uh, all the efforts uh, are not continued, are not uh, sustained in the in the long term. Uh, and um, I think when we talk about scientific publishing, uh, my personal uh, view is that we, we should more look towards Latin America than I, I would say uh, the other countries. And uh, so, so yes, please continue <laughs> to, to and, and maybe it's, it's also a global, uh, it's a global issue, the, the issue of the research assessment. And uh, even if I understand the governments that uh, have this pressure with impact factor, with competition for funding and so on, I would say that uh, to rely now uh, on impact factor uh, for publication and the choice of journals would, would be against the course of history because we see at least in Europe, uh, uh, a very strong political uh, movement towards uh, a more qualitative uh, research assessment. And uh, in two weeks from now in Paris, there will be a, a European uh, Open Science Conference and the European Commission will, will announce a, a very strong initiative regarding a reform of research assessment. So uh, of course, research assessment reform will take years and it's, uh, it's a very long process, but in the long term, uh, it's uh, it, it, it will be. I hope impact factor will not be uh, the uh, the key element in in research assessment anymore. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jean Francois. Um, I am I'm looking into our Q and A um, here, and uh, if I understand correctly, with my very poor Spanish. Apparently there was some issue with the visuals of this webinar. So I hope that um, this has been um, sorted somehow. And I hope that you are able to see the video of the webinar because that would be a pity if you, if you couldn't. Um, please do type uh, your questions into the Q&A um, and I will be uh, reading them out loud as they, as they come. Um, but in the meantime, I wanted to, uh, to ask our infrastructures. And this one, this question, Specifically, Alison, if you can stay a little bit longer here with us, because I think that I am particularly curious to ask you this question. So uh, Archive, as quite an established infrastructure, uh, very well known among researchers, why did you decide, decide to apply to SCOS? That's a great question. Um, really, it, uh, it came down to... Um, are exponentially increasing submissions and usage. Um, and looking at that with the, the, um, the old code base um, that was not scalable, um, you know, we're trying to uh, re-platform in modern um, languages and, um, and, do you know do these upgrades in a way that um, these microservices can interact with each other and we can um, we can update different components without having to change the whole system which is um, kind of the way things are set up now um, so you know SCOS is uh, is an organization that 
takes care to, um, to vet organizations, we care about being um, endorsed by SCOS. <laughs> and, um, you know, it means something to us that, uh, that the community around the world um, cares about open science infrastructures. Um, so really, if, you know, when we looked at our need and our need to expand, um, you know, our, to be able to hire um, a new developer um, to be able to to update our services. Um, it really it seemed like a no brainer. <laughs> so yeah. Okay, thank you, Alison. Um, Ariana, over to you because there is a question in Spanish uh, from Brenda. If you could uh, read it out loud, that would be great. I think you're muted, Ariana. Or maybe... Creo que Ariana tiene el micrófono cerrado. How can these platforms support a bigger digital inclusion to reduce educational inequalities in the context of COVID-19? Bueno, puedo contestar por mi parte y pasar. Let me answer first. For us, it's very important. There's a large number of publications that have been done in non-commercial uh, journals about COVID-19. And not only about the pandemic that unquestionably is what worries us right now, but some, it's something that we've discovered with the work that we're doing to establish the national mandate of open access in Angola, in Africa. We've realized that there are diseases like malaria that have local research, but are very critical for the quality of life at a national level, that are not being published in journals in other countries. They're not in the agenda of commercial journals, given that the disease hasn't uh, propagated to other countries. So we have this big opportunity for uh, non-commercial open access journals in universities to provide service to the problems of a country. And at a global scale, in the case of COVID-19, something similar happens in Latin America. Actually, in Redelic, we have a collection of everything that has been published on COVID-19 epidemics and the pandemic in general and physiological treatments, the new uh, remedies and solutions that have happened regionally that can be used in other places around the world and that are being communicated in our commercial journals. We need to globalize knowledge and this is a means is fundamental. And add uh, my my two cents here and, and talk about the space uh, uh, values uh, there. Uh, there's something I mentioned during my presentation, the fact that uh, throughout the whole pandemic, uh, the possibility to access preprints publications was very important to advance research and activities around COVID, for example. And preprints is what you can find uh, in repositories. Um, so the idea of creating something like a, a, an accessibility a network that is, can be accessed around the world. Uh, obviously, I mean, it, it was also mentioned before because of a question asked to the, to the board members. I mean, uh, how, how can you uh, uh, explain the importance of going uh, uh, also non-commercial journals? Uh, um, I, I personally think that there's a there's a role uh, for everything, and everyone plays the the, the 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 role that is important within an ecosystem. But the one of uh, I mean, open access, non commercial journals and repositories, it's it's a role that is growing because it means. Um, um, giving more people the chances to to access important acti important activities and, and information and data and and that's the other thing so it's not just about publications it's about uh, uh, allowing peer review on, on on a distributed network and those are some activities that are currently going on in our community uh, and you can create it based on uh, 
uh, open access and open source and open platform in, in terms of infrastructure we were talking about before, if you can, can create interoperabilities and protocols that uh, allows exchanging of data. Uh, so in terms of uh, 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 allowing more people to, to have a fair access to, to, to fair data, I mean, this is what we're all trying, trying to do. And, and those platforms are actually working on it. The, the broader the access and the more information people can actually uh, consume, uh, the, the more research and activities you can create and the fair it is, it is for everyone. Thank you so much, Michaela. I think that we will actually uh, close here, given our uh, time uh, con constraints. Um, thank you all so very much for coming. Uh, I hope it was um, a useful hour and one hour and a half for you, and that you learned about, uh, well, first of all, about the free infra infrastructures that we endorsed in this course third round. And uh, I hope that the ultimate outcome of this webinar will be many, many pledges uh, to archive Redalica Melica and DSpace. Um, if you have any questions, um, additional, um, you know, you need some additional information, please do make sure to contact uh, our infrastructures uh, directly. You have all the information on how to contact us on our website. And now I also understand that the question about the video was whether the recording will be available, which yes, it will be. It will be available uh, probably next week, as soon as next week on our on Spark Europe's YouTube channel. Once it's available, uh, we will make sure that uh, we communicate um, um, and that uh, you will all get the link to the recordings. Thank you again so, so very much uh, to all the panelists, to our audience, uh, and have a great afternoon, evening, day, wherever you are in the world. Thank you again. Goodbye for now. Bye-bye.